everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining for two Foresight Space Group. I'm really, really happy to have Robert Zubin here and uh, Kriyon. And I already just got a little bit of a preview of what we discussed today. Um, and yeah, it's going to be pretty exciting. I think Kriyon will probably be speaking for about like 40 minutes with Robert. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, if you want to make sure that your question gets answered already, feel free to drop it in the chat before. I'll be in the chat in case you have any questions. And really, really excited uh, for both of you to be here and excited for the discussion. Okay, so let's start. Uh, it's great to great to have you here, Bob. Um, so let me introduce Bob. So uh, uh, in my way, so I, I think I first encountered Bob when decades ago when I was a fresh out uh, engineering student who had just gotten was lucky enough to get a job with NASA, and I went to an AIAA conference, and I may have heard the very first or one of the first presentations you made on Mars Direct very early version in the, in the mid eighties. Um, and, uh, and it just, it hooked me. And so I've been kind of following your career and trying to help and invite youth places and even behind the scenes stuff. We've worked on a few little projects together, but never anything of much substance, but we've known each other for years. And anyway, uh, you're famous for many things, Bob, author, engineer, uh, public speaker, um, you know, uh, mover and shaker in the space industry, but perhaps the most famous thing or the thing that grabbed me for the personal story is Mars Direct. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about what is Mars Direct? How did it come to be? And also tie that in with your career and how did you come to be? Okay. Well, uh, all right, I'll start with me. Um, I was born in 52. Uh, the first memory I have of any major world revenge in terms of my personal experience is Sputnik. And while the uh, adults may have been terrified of Sputnik, I was just uh, exhilarated by it because I was already reading science fiction. And what Sputnik said to me was that all these stories I was reading about space travel uh, were, were going to be true. And so uh, I was on board immediately. Uh, and my parents encouraged my interest. My father got me a telescope and looked through it, did drawings of the moon through the eyepiece, launched rockets, did all the things that rocket boys did in the 60s. And, um, and I, you know, I was part of a generation that was inspired by uh, the moon program and by the, the, you know, we were going to the moon by 1970, Mars by 1980, Saturn by 1990, Alpha Centauri by the year 2000. This was the program and I wanted to be part of it. So I learned all the science I could and so forth. But by the time I got into college in the early 70s, they were shutting down the program. Uh, the Nixon administration uh, rejected NASA's plans to continue on to Mars. NASA was going to go to Mars by 1981 uh, and have a permanent base there by the late 80s. And that, you know, uh, was like uh, Ferdinand and Isabella saying to Columbus after he came back, look, uh, we don't care, get lost. Um, the, 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 you know, it was a, and anyway, so the thing was ending and I was in college and the so-called real world got to me. And said, look, it, it's all wonderful to be 12 years old and think you're going to be a space explorer. But, you know, this is the real world. And to the extent there are space explorers, they live on the other side of the TV screen, along with the movie stars and other celebrities. And that they, they, they're not part of our world. And the the so you have got to get yourself a trade. And I'm part of the first generation of my family to go to college. So went to college to have a trade, okay? And, uh, and the idea of grad school didn't even occur to me, frankly. Um, but okay, I'll be a science teacher. I know a lot of science, I can teach science, so fine. So I became a science teacher and I did that for about seven years um, on and off. And the, um, but you know, around 19, 82 or so. I'm living in northern Manhattan and teaching in Brooklyn and commuting an hour and 15 minutes each way on the subway and reading novels by Herman Melville about sailing the South Seas and saying, what am I doing here? Okay, what am I doing here? And this is not what I signed up for. 
So by this time, I was aware of things called graduate school, and I applied, and, and uh, I did very well on the GRE test, so I got into a lot of places, and I decided to go to the University of Washington because it was the furthest from Manhattan, and, um, and I went there, and I uh, actually majored in nuclear engineering because uh, at that time, uh, I thought that nuclear fusion was the major breakthrough that was going to happen in the last part of the 20th century, so that was where I wanted to be. Um, but while I was doing that, and I also managed to pick up a, a master's in aerospace because of uh, certain overlaps in my classes and so forth, um, I heard about these people called the Mars Underground. And these were people like Chris McKay and Penelope Boston and Carol Stoker holding conferences in Boulder, trying to put Mars back on the agenda of NASA. Um, and um, so I went. I went to the third case for Mars conference in 67, excuse me, 87. And, um, and it was just fantastic. And uh, this was a much more interesting problem than fusion. It was multifaceted and included energy, but life support launch vehicles, uh, exploration agendas, the search for life. This was really very attractive uh, as a design problem to uh, someone like me. Um, and, and I met Ben Clark, who was leading the studies at uh, Martin Marietta uh, on how to do human Mars missions. And I made a good contact with him. He asked for my resume. A year later, I was working there. And then what happened was in 89, President Bush got up on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, flanked by the Apollo 11 crew. And he said, you know, this is the 20th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. That was great. That's what America's all about. And therefore I, as president, are committing us to go back to the moon and on to Mars and this time to stay. This is great stuff. So they began, uh, okay, it was called the Space Exploration Initiative. Now, NASA ran off to conduct a study on how this might be accomplished, okay? But the people leading that study were not really interested in getting back to the moon, let alone Mars. They were interested in using this uh, uh, as a pseudo imperative to justify the broadest array of technology programs that currently uh, NASA was interested in pursuing. So they designed the most complicated mission possible um, in order to make everyone's pet technology mission critical, which is the exact opposite of the correct way to do engineering. Okay. And so they came up with a plan, a 90-day report plan, and $400 billion, 30 years. And a number of engineers at Martin went to senior management, and we said, look, okay, this is an absurd plan. And if the matter is left there, this program is dead. And I have to say that the Martin management rose on this occasion to the occasion because, and this is very unusual, actually. Because in aerospace, usually the wisdom is parrot whatever NASA is saying. Do not disagree with the customer. Okay. But there were people there, and I'll give special credit to a guy named Al Shalaman, a very interesting fellow, who was a vice president, said, that's right. We have to come up with a better plan. And so they commissioned a group, which was called the Scenario Development Team, which was composed of the 12 most creative people in the Martin Company. And I was one of them. And and said, come up with a better plan. And actually we came up with three better plans and they were all different from each other. And, um, and Mars Direct was the most radical break with the paradigm that NASA was pursuing. And now again, Shalom Mueller, really smart, did not try to reconcile the plan into a unified company position. It would have been impossible. Instead he said, let's float all three and see which one grows. And we floated all three to NASA in the spring, privately, in the spring of 1990. And it very quickly became clear that the Mars Direct plan, which I was largely responsible for, along with another engineer named David Baker and supported by some other engineers, uh, was the one that had the chance to really shake things up. It immediately became extremely controversial um, and with support. Uh, vigorous support from both within NASA and some of our competitors uh, who also saw the same thing, that we needed a better plan or there would be no program. And then also uh, there was a counterattack from the space station people because we did not use the space station. And it was catechism at this point in NASA that any missions beyond Earth orbit had to be built at the space station um, because and anyone who proposed to do a, a mission beyond Earth orbit uh, 
without doing on orbit construction at giant hangars created at the space station was de-justifying the program and therefore was uh, an infidel. And the, the and you kill all infidels wherever you find them. That's in the Quran. Now the the um, so, uh, but it, it it really shook things up. And um, and then uh, Griffin became associate administrator for uh, space exploration, and he heard about this, and he had me come in and brief him, and he liked it. And he said, I, interruption oh. interruption there. By the way, he's speaking of Mike Griffin, who's another force of nature who we should probably get on this uh this this show but uh go on right so he had me go back to jsc and brief them again but this time Johnson space the center houston mission control yes. right with the boss telling him you got to listen to this guy so they did and they went and then designed their own version of the mars direct mission which is called design reference mission drm3 um and it was bigger. Uh, it had a crew of six instead of a crew of four. It um, had a lot of extra stuff because they had a lot of overhead of people who insisted that their greenhouse be included in the mission or something else and all kinds of things. But nevertheless, the same team that had costed the 90-day report mission at $400 billion costed their version of the Morris Direct mission at $55 billion. Uh, Great. Okay, not just a mission, but a whole program based on. Okay. And, you know, and I said, look, you don't need this. You don't need that. You could get it down to 30. And actually Sagan said, Carl Sagan, look, Bob, you just live with it. Okay. The point is not whether it's 30 billion or 50 billion. The point that it's 50 billion, not 500 billion. Okay. And Newsweek actually heard about this. And uh, 1994, was the 25th anniversary of the Apollo landing and they were gonna cover it and they made Mars Direct the cover story. Um, that well, now fantastic. Hey, uh, I mean, I don't want to cut you off and continue maybe uh, taking us as far as you'd like, but at some point we're gonna to have to talk about the very basics of Mars Direct. Well, the basic idea is direct flight to Mars, direct return from earth using propellant made on Mars. Okay, the Von Braun paradigm was on orbit assembly of giant spaceships that could fly to Mars and back with little landing crafts going down to the surface and back up again, maximum cost, minimum accomplishment, requiring all sorts of orbital infrastructure to accomplish uh, in it, it, basically an entire parallel universe in which giant spaceships are constructed. And yeah, nuclear powered spaceships, by the way. Well, in some iterations, yes. Okay, I mean, th there's a variations on that theme. You could have giant solar electric spaceships too, which were even more absurd. But the, the, the Mars Direct was, the way it worked was first you shoot an Earth return vehicle to Mars and it filled, fuels it automated, no one in it, fuels itself with methane oxygen propellant made well, at that time, we didn't know there was water available other than at the pole. We would bring the hydrogen, react it with Martian CO2, and make methane oxygen by propellant. If we were to do it now, I would get the hydrogen from Martian water. Um, but either way, even bringing the hydrogen, 95% of the propellant mass is coming from Mars. Now you got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting waiting for you on the Martian surface. That done, you shoot the crew out in a habitat spacecraft and they go direct to the surface to where the Earth return vehicle is. They you shoot them, you shoot them, you shoot the crew along with a second return vehicle, as I recall. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm giving you the basic idea yeah. that is okay. First, you send an Earth return vehicle, then two, it makes its propellant, then two years later, you send a habitat craft along with another Earth return vehicle. They go and they land at landing site number one. The other vehicle could be landed at landing site number one or anywhere else. I prefer to land it a few hundred kilometers away so it's available to them, but otherwise defines a new landing site. Um, but it's the backup. They explore Mars for a year and a half. They get in the Earth return vehicle, fly back to Earth, leave your half behind on Mars. Each time you do this, you'll add another habitat to your infrastructure on Mars, whether a dispersed network of them or eventually concentrated one place to build a major base. And there's basically nothing in this that's fundamentally beyond our technology. Um, and as I say, this general approach of no on-orbit assembly, uh, 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 direct to Mars, direct return using in-situ propellant. And if you want to go direct back 
you have to use in situ propellant. The reason for orbital rendezvous is because if you're going to go all the way down and come back up and bring the propellant, that's uh, out of question. So um, now this plan uh, has since been embraced as the basis of the SpaceX Mars mission plan, although they altered it. He has the Starship. First of all, he refuels the Starship itself on Earth orbit, but then sends it direct to Mars, lands it on Mars, and then makes the return propellant on Mars to send it back. Okay, now uh, that's not exactly the way I would design the mission, but he still gets away from all this orbital infrastructure and all this other stuff. And once again, it's the travel light and live off the land approach. The same thing that makes Mars interesting, that it has all the materials necessary to support life, also makes it has all the materials necessary to support technological civilization, starting with propellant manufacturing. So that's the Mars direct plan. Okay. And there's a number of ways you could vary it. And I discussed it at length in, in my book, The Case for Mars, um, which actually just came out with a third edition, 2001, with a little blurb from Elon Musk on the cover says 2021 yes uh the book was first published in 96 revised in 2011 and then again in 2021 um so it's been in print now for uh, 26 years which is pretty good uh and um as i say there's a little um blurb from musk on the cup uh, the original That's edition had the blurb from carl Sagan. So speaking of Musk, maybe you could talk a little bit about, if you care to, about sort of the backstory around uh, Musk and you and the Mars Society, which you should also mention, and uh, SpaceX and the evolution of their um, business program. Okay. The book came out in 96, okay, because the literary agent read the Newsweek article. She called me up at my desk at Martin and encouraged me to write a book, and I did, and she sold it to Simon and & Schuster. And oh, hey, sorry, I need to interrupt one more time. Speaking of Martin, you did some very important experiments with your colleagues at Martin to, to verify this thing. Could you mention that briefly? Sure. Uh, we got uh, to demonstrate the making of propellant on Mars. Uh, and the way you make the propellant is you electrolyze water, that produces oxygen. The hydrogen can be reacted with uh, CO2 to produce methane and water. The water goes to the electrolyzer, the methane is your fuel. It's a very simple cycle. It's 19th century industrial chemistry. and Still, NASA was skeptical of this uh, because this was sort of unfamiliar to them. Um, although, I mean, I kept on telling them, look, this is the only part of the mission that could have been done in Jules Verne's time. Um, and it, it vastly simpler than getting to Earth orbit is making methane oxygen out of water and CO2. Um, but we had to prove it. So we got a $47,000 contract, uh, which is got to be the smallest hardware contract that Martin Marietta ever got. And we committed to do this thing in three months. And we did. It. And the thing was over 94% efficient. It just worked. Okay. Uh, it basically were proving to NASA that wheels rolled. So we did that. And since that time, uh, both uh, later at Martin, and then since I, I left Martin in 96 to start my own company, Pioneer Astronautics, we have um, uh, greatly advanced that technology into flight-like systems. Um, but it's it's fundamentally elementary. And okay, so it's back to the Musk story. Right. So the book was a success. It sold 150,000 copies within a year and more since, and, and came out in lots of languages. And I got 4,000 letters. Letters, okay, a, a few emails, but really mostly postal letters at that time um, from people all over the world saying, well, they said everything, okay, but they came from astronauts and JPL engineers and 12-year-old kids in Poland and firemen in Saskatoon and the widow of somebody who won the Medal of Honor in World War II and just this, uh, the director of the opera in New York City, a, a banker in Paris. You couldn't believe the array of talent that was represented by these letters. And, the, 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 and they're saying all sorts of things, but underneath it, they were asking one question, which is, how do we make this happen? So I got together with my friends in the Mars Underground, like Chris McKay and Carol Stoker, and said, look, if we could pull these together, we'd have a force to make this happen, or at least to try to make this happen. So we founded the Mars Society, held the founding conference in Boulder, 1998, 700 people showed up in the New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, all there. And we came out of the conference with an organization 
um, 25 chapters. Now there's 40 or so. The, 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 and we resolved to do three things. One, spread the vision. Two, engage in political work to defend NASA's and ESA's Mars programs. And three, do projects of our own, of which we determined that the first one would be the founding of a Mars analog research station in the Canadian Arctic. This is something that had been talked about actually since Apollo, but never done. And it's an obvious thing, practice for Mars on Earth. Okay, so this required money. And actually I, I, I raised the money um, from a, a number of dot-com billionaire types, not including Musk. But then we decided to uh, do another one in the American desert, the, what's now called the Mars Desert Research Station. We had a fundraiser in Silicon Valley at the house of uh, Bill Clancy, who you may know, because um, he w also worked at NASA Ames, as, as you did. Um, but in any case, uh, Clancy was well-off person in a very nice house, and we had a fundraiser at his house, and $500 a plate. And we get this one check from somebody, $5,000. Why is somebody sending us $5,000 for $500 plate? Who is this person? Elon Musk. Never heard of him. Um, so we did some research and we discovered that he was one of the uh, tops of uh, PayPal. And I said, okay. So now we had heard of PayPal because a bunch of irritating people wanted to pay their dues through PayPal instead of with credit cards or checks like normal people. And so, um, but I decided to put the grievance aside and I met with him for a two hour cup of coffee before the meeting and had him sit next to all the right people at the meeting, including I think Carol and uh, James Cameron, who was there. Um, and uh, got him. And so he joined the Mars Society. In fact, he joined the board of the Mars Society and, uh, and he gave $100,000, which helped create the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, so he was in. Uh, I mean, he had read the case for Mars. Okay, that's basically what recruited him to making Mars his calling. And this helped further that along. But after a while on the board, he said to me, look, you know, I'm not the kind of person that wants to be part of somebody else's deal. I got to run my own show, okay? And uh, I've already made all the money I could possibly want in my life. Uh, and I'm trying to think of what to do with the rest of my life. I want to do something really important. Uh, and I'm debating between humans to Mars and solar energy. These were the two things that he thought were the most important things that could be done and he, he, he would want to make happen. Now, I acted very forcefully for making Mars his calling. I said, look, solar energy, the business case is obvious. If anybody's got a technology that could make that competitive against fossil fuels, they're going to get investors, okay? Uh, but humans to Mars, no. Uh, so it take extraordinary vision. Now, in the end, he decided to do both, and then he started the car company too. Um, but um, that was how that worked. And, uh, and I, I make no claim. Uh, for any of the accomplishments of SpaceX, um, uh, that those are the accomplishments of Musk and the SpaceX team. There are a lot of people in the SpaceX team who also came out of the Mars Society or were otherwise influenced by the case for Mars. Uh, and that is why they work much harder than any other aerospace company for, in fact, less pay um, because they want to make this happen. And if you walk into SpaceX in Hawthorne, you'll see a giant picture of Mars on the wall as you walk in every day. And as you walk in, leave every day, every employee sees it. That's what this thing is about. Everything else is just steps to that. Musk wants to make humanity a, a, a space-faring uh, species. And he considers, as I consider, that uh, the, uh, the settlement of Mars is absolutely central to that goal. Why do you, um, just on a tangent here, you know, we've got moon people, we've got Mars people, we've got space colony people, uh, maybe say a little bit about uh, why Mars is the, is the gold ring. Well, in terms of settlement, Mars is the planet that has the materials necessary for settlement. Uh, okay, there's a little bit of water in permanently shadowed craters in the moon, but otherwise the thing is so dry that lunar colonists would mine concrete to get the water out of it. Mars is continent-sized regions that are 60% water by weight. There's glaciers with pure water ice that come down as far as 38 degrees north, which is the latitude of San Francisco uh, on Earth. Uh, so there's also carbon dioxide, carbon, 
fundamental to life and industry is, is it, it all available all over Mars. It's not available on the moon. Nitrogen is available on Mars. It is absent on the moon. About half the elements of industry are absent from the moon or otherwise, I mean, you know, Mars has had complex geological processes that are necessary to form mineral ore. On Earth, early civilizations were able to use copper and bronze, even though there's less than 100 parts per million of the required elements in the Earth's crust, because there are geological processes on Earth that have created copper or even metallic copper. I mean, American Indians use uh, copper tools in some places. And, and but on the moon, it's all trash rock. There, there's no geological processes that have concentrated rare elements into ores. Mars has had this. Mars is a 24 hour day, moon, two weeks, light and dark. Mars um, oh, has that means an atmosphere that's thick enough to mask out solar flares and micrometeorites. The moon does not. The, in every way, Mars is a superior prospect for human settlement. Okay, so speaking of the 24 hour day and just rewinding just for a sec here. Um, isn't there, wasn't there this whole greenhouse on Mars thing? And then with Elon's mind and, you know, because you can grow plants because there's a 24 hour day, which you can't on the moon unless you use artificial light. Could you briefly talk about that? Well, sure. First of all, artificial light. Uh, I'm not a big fan of solar energy, but it does work great for outdoor lighting in the daytime. And the, um, and I mean, if you look at the amount of sunlight that is consumed in growing crops in Rhode Island, that agricultural giant, it, to generate that artificially is more than the entire electric capacity of the human race today. Um, th th that's how much light, you know, it's a kilowatt for every square meter. Um, you know, it's it's a megawatt for every hectare. It, it, you know, you just go on. And the... the um, In any case, uh, so this is uh, ridiculous to, to have to grow crops with artificial light on any scale. Uh, but Mars has this, it has got the 24 hour day and furthermore, it can mask out solar flares. And so you can actually grow crops on the surface of Mars using greenhouses with thin walls. If you tried to grow crops on the lunar surface, you'd have to have it made of thick glass uh, or, or something like that to, to mask out the solar flares. Uh, so from the point of view of agriculture, Mars is, is greatly superior to uh, the moon, in addition to the fact that the carbon is there. <laughs> you know, carbon dioxide and water, this is what you need to grow plants. Mars has it, the moon does not. All right, that's, that's a, a great summary. And I guess we can say the same about space colonies, but you know- Well, you could, the space colonies are even more problematical. Those are absolutely ridiculous. The idea, of, I mean, an O'Neill colony, even a small one, is like a billion tons in Earth orbit. Uh, it's a lot easier to settle a planet than to build one. <laughs> good, good, good tagline. Okay, um, so all right, let's uh, let's see. Where are we? We are um, we're at the half hour, so yeah. um, we have a few more minutes on on this part. So you you do you've done a lot besides Mars Direct. Would you mind talking a bit? Go through some of your books and um, and your company, your companies, and what you're working on, and maybe some okay. Well, in 96, I left Martin, which became Lockheed Martin a little before that. But anyway, I left it to have my own company so I have more creative freedom. Um, and the company has been moderately successful. That is, we're still in business after 26 years, not terribly large. I got right now about 15 employees. My payroll has wandered between seven and 20, depending upon how lucky I am in winning contracts. Um, the... Uh, we have demonstrated a lot of novel technologies here, uh, including additional Mars ISRU technology, such as the reverse water gas shift was first demonstrated here. Uh, we've done uh, incredible things with high altitude balloon work, um, done some military work, uh, life support systems, uh, propulsion. Um, but I, but a half of our total work is this area that NASA calls in situ resource utilization, but which I prefer to call local resource creation. Uh, because you see, I, I don't believe, and this is a very important point, there's no such thing as a natural resource. There is no, natural resources do not exist, okay? There are only natural raw materials. It is human creativity that turns a material into a resource. For example, land. 
land was not a resource until people invented agriculture. Okay, that's why when the Indians sold Manhattan to Peter Minuit for $24, they thought they were taking him for a ride. Land is worthless. Okay, the, 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 anyone knows that. Okay, the, the land is only worth something if you do farming. Okay, the, 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 now uh, iron. Okay, we had human civilizations existing for 3000 years before they used iron. They used copper and tin to make bronze which, as I say, is 100 parts per million in the Earth's crust. Iron is 100,000 parts per million in the Earth's crust. But to them, this is 3,000 years, okay? It was just dirt. Want to know why? Because their kilns were not hot enough to smell iron. They're hot enough to smell copper, not iron. So for them, iron was not a resource, just as aluminum was not a resource until the late 19th century, okay? You can go to any genuine antique store and uh, look at 19th century or earlier artifacts. You won't find a single thing made of aluminum. Now it's all over the place. Okay. Okay. And uh, the, the and uranium, of course, was not a resource till we developed nuclear fission. It was used for paint, uh, the red paint. Now the, the 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 but here it is. It's a massive energy resource. Thorium. Okay. Deuterium is not currently a resource, but it will be once we develop fusion power. The, 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 the resources are created by human ingenuity. Now, the place, Mars has no resources now, but it will once there are resourceful people there, okay? And in other words, you can inhabit a place. A place becomes resourceful for you if you've got the technology, more fundamentally, if you've got the ingenuity to create the technology that turns the materials there into resources. Okay, two people can be stranded in the wood. One can live there indefinitely in, in relative comfort. The other could starve to death in two weeks. And why? To one, there are no resources in the wood and to the other, there's plenty. Right. And I said, you were somewhat uh, in, inspired by the early explorers, uh, right? For your live off the land kind of, kind of stuff with the Arctic explorers. Sure, even, even as an exploration technique, explorers can be far more effective if they can turn the materials and the environments they are exploring into resources. This is why Amundsen was successful in doing the Northwest Passage, okay? He, he used for transportation dogs and dog sleds, okay? And uh, because the dogs could be fed with a caribou meat, unlike horses, which would starve. Um, and it was also why he was successful in reaching the South Pole and Scott who brought ponies to the South Pole died. Um, the, 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 okay. So, and, and you can make any, any number of historical things. Is travel light, live off the land. That's the way to explore. And it's absolutely necessary if you're going to settle. Okay. okay. So let's, let's um, um, pivot a bit and talk about some of your, uh, your other books, because you've written quite a few. I don't even know, at least five. Yeah, sure. Actually 13, but the, um, okay. But Okay, a few of them are not. I've read five. Okay. So okay. All right. Well, you got a homework. Now the. Uh, okay. Well, uh, there's the case for Mars, and uh, another book called Entering Space, uh, and uh, uh, Mars on Earth, which is about the Mars Society's project to build the Arctic Station and the Desert Station. There's my most recent book is called The Case for Space, uh, which really looks at this entrepreneurial space revolution that is going on now and what its implications are to it opening and expanding the human future in space. I wrote a humorous book called How to Live on Mars, which is really a lot of fun. Uh, it's a guide to immigrants to Mars uh, in the year 2100, written by an old hand who tells them, you know, how to be a success on Mars, how to pick up girls on Mars, how to get rich on Mars, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and um, the, the um, so that's a fun book. Uh, I wrote a book called The Holy Land, which was a science fiction satire of the war on terrorism. Um, I, I, you know, written a lot of books. Um, you've you wrote books on energy, you've written books. Oh, yes. I wrote a book called Energy Victory, How to Break OPEC and the Oil Cartel. I wrote a book called Merchants of Despair, which is about the Malthusians um, and how they have been responsible for nearly every major human caused disaster in the past 200 years. And this is the flip side of my commitment to space, okay? Because look, 
why do we have to open space? And you can identify all the great things we're going to do in space and the marvelous future for humanity we're going to create in space. And that is all true. We can create something wonderful. And if you have it in your power to create something wonderful, then you should. But how does this relate to our current predicament here on Earth? Okay, what is the major threat facing humanity today? Okay, um, the, you know, if we had this conversation two years ago, I'd probably get a lot of people saying global warming, and I probably still get a few. Now, actually, I believe global warming is real. Uh, I, I'm, I do not contradict the, uh, the data produced by the UN panel and all this stuff. It's all real. The world temperature has gone up a degree in the past 150 years, and it's likely to go up another degree in this century, and that's fine. Uh, it's not fine, but it's true. But it doesn't threaten our existence this year, okay, or next year, or in the next 30 years. It, it poses certain issues, sea levels going up in certain places, and you're going to have to build dikes and things. And, but it's not an existential threat to human civilization. What is an ex existential threat to human civilization is global war, okay? That is the threat. That could kill you this year, okay? It could kill you next week. Uh, and the, the, but certainly this year. And the, the, and what was the cause of the global wars of the 20th century? Okay. And associated catastrophes, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, and so forth. Uh, they were all caused by bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea, which came in a variety of forms. And what that bad idea was is that there isn't enough for everybody. So we have to take what's here so that they don't get it or so they don't come and take it from us, okay? Because we're all enemies on this planet, okay? And, you know, the, you know, the Nazis put it in the crudest, but the simplest point of view, the human race is a struggle for existence of various races over limited resources. Adolf Hitler said uh, the, the laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so the better may live. 1912. General Friedrich von Bernhardi, the chief intellectual of the German general staff, published a bestseller called Germany in the Next War, in which he said, look, here's Eurasia. Who's going to get it? Either us Germans or the Russians. We're going to have to fight them for it sooner or later. Should it be sooner or later? Well, sooner, because we can take them down now before the industrialized later might not be possible. So let's do it. And that is why they seized on the pretext of the assassination of the Archduke two years later to launch World War I. And then once again, Hitler with even more hysterical ideas. And, you know, Germany needs living space. Germany never needed living space. Germany today is smaller than the Third Reich and has a larger population, but a vastly higher standard of living. Why? Not because they succeeded in capturing lands and killing people so they could steal their cows. Okay. No, it's because of the global advance of science and technology, which is a project of the human race as a whole, to which Germans have certainly contributed, but so have many other people, including very notably people they were trying to exterminate. And had they won, they'd be far poorer today than they were, okay? Because it is not true that human race is a variety of nations or races in a struggle for existence over limited resources. Rather, we are a family, a disorderly family, to be sure, of, of, of people who are engaged in a joint project to expand the resources of humanity by creating new technologies. Because inventions made anywhere ultimately become uh, uh, used everywhere. Okay, so uh, you, society evolves, but it does not evolve in the Darwinian way. So uh, progress does not occur through superior civilizations eliminating inferior civilization. It, it occurs by civilizations everywhere making contributions which then get transferred everywhere. In other words, human evol social evolution is not Darwinian because inherited, uh, acquired traits can be inherited and, and not just from your parents, but from people that you are unrelated to, okay? Uh, this is the fundamental truth. And so you see, but nevertheless, this idea that we are engaged in a struggle for limited resources will, if it is accepted, will cause catastrophe in the 21st century. And the thing about opening space and creating a new world on Mars, it's not that we're going to get oil from Mars. We're not going to get oil from Mars. It's conceivable we will get useful inventions from Martian civilizations. I believe that will happen because they'll be forced to invent new technologies. It'll be a very abundant source of technological innovation that will benefit us. But an even bigger benefit is that what we're going to get from Mars is the truth, that it is not true, 
okay, that there's only so much to come uh, to go around because the earth comes with an infinite sky. And if we work together, we can throw it wide open. And so there's no point killing each other, fighting over provinces. When we're working together, we can create planets. All right. Very well said, Bob. We all agree with this stuff, but it's, it's great. It's great to hear you. And I, I highly recommend Merchants of Despair. It's a really uh, powerful, uh, controversial, but right on book as far as I'm concerned. It had a big effect on me. Um, so maybe uh, we can end my portion of the dialogue with you here and then throw it open to Q&A after the final thing, which is um, what's going on now? I think we've heard about your concerns and what gives you hope, which is going to be the final question, but like what's going on now with, with your career and with, um, and your kind of summary of the, uh, of the uh, space renaissance? Okay, well, I'm still carrying on here at Pioneer Astronautics doing stuff and uh, um, various innovations in space technology, mostly civil space. I had some involvement in military space. Uh, the, I, I believe the defense of Western civilization, which has got its flaws, but it's better than the alternative uh, and uh, is, is very important. Um, and uh, so I'm doing that and doing the Mars Society. We just had a very successful convention in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, at Arizona State University. Um, and you know we're carrying on. We um, spreading the vision, defending the programs, building our stations. Uh, we had a delegation from Mongolia came and spoke at the banquet. Uh, I hope my wife and I had just visited Mongolia. We were welcomed by the new Mongolian chapter of the Mars Society, which is gigantic. They have 3,000 members, um, including people like bank presidents and government ministers and about 100 really active volunteers. And they're going to build a station in the Gobi. Uh, they, know how to live off, they know how to live off the land in Mongolia. Actually, I, they do. Uh, a lot of... Um, Mongols would be good space explorers. They had a rough it. Uh, I got to tell you, um, the uh, a lot of things that we had to work out over time in the Arctic to make our Arctic station work, they do as a matter of course. It's just standard Mongol practice. Uh, and the um, so that was exciting. And but we had a lot of great talks from people representing the various NASA missions. Pam Melroy, the deputy administrator, uh, Blue Origin showed up for the first time ever. Um, the, um, uh, which is nice. Um, the, the, we had a, a great debate, uh, over the, the search for life on Mars. And it was the contention of me and also Steve Benner, who, by the way, is a person who you should have at your forum. He's, uh, a leading a astrobiologist and he's also the first person to synthesize a gene. Um, the, 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 that NASA's current uh, Mars exploration program is not searching for light. That's what the public relations department says it is because that's what the public rightly is interested in. But in fact, it's just doing geology, which is useful. Uh, it sets the context for the search for life, but it's not the search for life. There hasn't been a NASA, uh, a life detection experiment sent to Mars since 1976. And this is in large part because of the planetary protection bureaucracy, which has basically made it impossible. Um, they've made it impossible to do the most important science on Mars. Um, the, um, so, um, that was a very exciting debate. Um, uh, there was also Jim Bell participated in it and he's a member of various NASA, uh, committees and he, he defended the existing program. But if people want to see the debate and what the different people said, it's all on YouTube. So that's what's going on. All right. So, uh, let's see, uh, we are at, um, Perfect time to open it up to audience questions. If we have some, I haven't really been um, keeping track. Is Alison or someone mentioning that? Yes, we do have a few. Uh, first one is Angeliki. Angeliki. Um, yeah. Hi, Robert. I was wondering, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts about the care and the uh, Artemis architecture and the uh, return to the moon and um, regarding the starship as well? Like, what? What do you think? How fast it can be um, fully reusable and like the whole architecture put it then to the moon? Okay, well, um, I, I believe Artemis is a very confused program. Um, well, first of all, I give the Trump people who created it one cheer. 
uh, they recognized that NASA's human spaceflight program needed to have a goal, and that is fundamental. And you can't just keep flying astronauts up and down to the space station for no particular reason, other than to keep distributing money to the contractors who support that effort, uh, um, that there needs to be a goal. Now, I think they chose the wrong goal, the moon, and they went about it the wrong way. Um, the the uh, the proper goal should be Mars. Mars is where the science is, it's where the challenge is, it's where the future is, but they chose the moon, at least it's something. Uh, but then they didn't organize a coherent program. Um, for instance, they made the gateway program uh, fundamental to their program, despite the fact that it has nothing to do with sending humans to the moon. Uh, it's, it's a toll booth on the way to the moon. And I would contrast this to John F. Kennedy, who did not try to base the Apollo program on the X-15, even though that was a, uh, a major NASA program at that time, it wasn't suitable. Uh, and he, he said, we're gonna go to the moon in eight years, figure out how to do it and do it. And here, you know, the Trumps said that we're gonna get back to the moon by 2024, but they did not do uh, what was necessary. I mean, here they got a lunar program without a lander. Um, now, okay. Uh, so th this program needs uh, reform um, if it's actually to get to the moon. Um, now, as far as Starship, that's a more interesting question. Um, Starship could be a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, it's a fully uh, reusable heavy lift vehicle with a capability in the same class as the Saturn V, but would have launch costs perhaps 3% as great uh, because it's reusable. Uh, the SpaceX team, has already made history through introducing partial reusability. And they've, you know, the cost of space launch was $10,000 a kilogram from 1970 to 2010. It was like a law of physics. Um, in, in the past uh, decade, they've cut it down to 2,000 kilogram factor of five by having mostly reusable vehicles that also launch with great frequency. Because the other thing, cost of the vehicles is not just the vehicles, but the team to support the vehicles and the same team that you're paying if they can support uh, launch a Falcon 9 once a week, it's going to cost you much less per launch than if you launch for a year. Um, and uh, so this is a, a revolution in uh, uh, space launch costs, and it will uh, encourage a lot more private space uh, initiatives because the, the, they'll all become the uh, the numbers will add up much better with cheaper space launch. And the cheaper the space launch is, the faster uh, spacecraft technology will advance because the less conservative spacecraft designers need to be if the launch is cheaper. You know, for the half century after Apollo, uh, the, by the time of Apollo, anything you needed to do in space, there was a way to do it. So there was a proven way to do anything. And if the launch is gonna cost you a fortune, why risk trying something new? Um, and so they didn't. Now, a lot of new things are gonna be tried. So now the Starship, if it's successful, will probably reduce launch costs by another factor of five. Um, and uh, this will make even a much larger variety of space initiatives possible and even things like intercontinental travel using uh, uh, space vehicles. Uh, the, which would have an enormously expanded market for rockets. Uh, now, the Starship's going to be copied. There are already people copying Falcon 9. Um, uh, there's at least five companies in China that are tr trying to copy it. There's also, um, I, the Rocket Lab is not copying Falcon 9, but th they are introducing a vehicle with comparable uh, uh, characteristics of being uh, largely reusable with an expendable upper stage, and, but they run on methane oxygen. Uh, and 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 they will do it. Uh, so there's going to be competition, and Musk knows that, which is why he's got to stay. The, the Falcons will no longer be unchallenged three years from now. They will be challenged, and so he starships will give him something that's better than a Falcon, and then people will copy the starships, and he'll have to come up with something better than that. So this is a very positive dynamic. Now, furthermore, here's another fact. If you have reusable launch vehicles, there will be used launch vehicles. Okay, so not everybody can afford to buy a new car at today's prices, but practically everybody can afford to buy a used car. Everybody's got a car, even people of fairly low income, because there's a used car market, and they it, they can 
get a car that way. So people are going to be able to get space launch capability that way. Okay. You know, Musk told me and it's going to cost him $10 million to build the Starship. That is the, the second stage. That's the Starship proper. The lower stage is called the super heavy. Um, which if so, he'd probably be willing to sell them for 20 million, which means that they'd probably be available on the used market eventually for 5 million, maybe 3 million. And guess what? If it could take 100 people to Mars and they all chip in, $5 million divided by 100 people is $50,000 person. Buy the ship, take it to Mars one way and use it as your housing on Mars while you build existing. In other words, Mars colonization is going to become possible once there is uh, and, and by various groups of people, uh, once there are used starships available, um, which they will be, okay, because reusable launch vehicles means used launch vehicles. Uh, so this will open up uh, the road to Mars. Um, um, also, there's another factor here, which is, look, it is noteworthy that these uh, great innovations uh, are occurring in a free country. Okay, uh, they are not occurring in Russia, despite the fact that there's capital in Russia uh, owned by people who believe in human expansion into the cosmos and significant technical talent. But nobody can create a company like this in Russia because the Kremlin kleptocrats would just steal it from them. Um, the, the, the freedom gives us technology. Okay. And this technology, by the way, is what's allowing Ukraine to uh, be fighting Russia on conditions of rough equality right now, despite the fact that the Russians outnumber them 10 to 1. This is a space war in Ukraine, okay? It, it's, it, it, it is, uh, the Ukraines are taking advantage of space-based reconnaissance, space-based uh, communications, including Starlink, which is created by uh, SpaceX, and um, uh, the GPS guided munitions. Um, that, that is, that's what's giving them the ability to fight despite the fact that in conventional terms, they appear to be hopeless. Um, they're actually getting the better of the fight. And the, the, the because this is what freedom does. And, uh, you know, and, and provided must doesn't do things that cause uh, the American national security establishment to have some doubts about them, uh, they're gonna give them a lot of support. Uh, you can count on it. Um, and, and the rest of them as well. This is a, a major edge. This is why the arc of history tends towards liberty because freedom carries a stick. Um, it really does. And uh, the, 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 it is an adaptive trait for societies. It gives them superior capabilities, industrial, medical, and military. Uh, and, and one more thing I should say, uh, by the way, in conjunction with this, uh, since we're talking about Mars colonization, there are some people who say a Mars colony could easily become a tyranny because the authorities there can turn off your air if you don't follow orders. I, I, I don't believe that that is true. And I'll tell you why. I believe there will be many Mars colonies and the ones that grow will be the ones that attract immigrants. And a tyranny won't attract immigrants. Okay, so it will not grow. So it is impossible from the point of view of natural selection because the a tyranny on Mars defies the principle necessary for its growth, which is that it attract immigrants by offering uh, a, a better way of life, a greater chance for people to realize their human potential. It will need people to realize the human potential because it will also need to be highly inventive in order to survive and progress. But even the very first principle of getting people to move there, it requires freedom. Speaking of uh, the politics of the day, any, uh, and then we'll end with one or two last audience questions, but uh, any comment on uh, the news cycle of uh, Elon and Twitter? Well, I actually wrote Elon a couple months ago and told him he was wasting his time with Twitter. And he uh, responded saying, yeah, I, I think so. And he tried to get out of the deal. I don't know. I, I, I don't claim that he did because I told him that probably a thousand people told him that. Um, and um, the, but then the lawsuit, I think, compelled him to go ahead with the acquisition. Um, and I, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, 
I, I think it's a waste of his time. That's what I told him then, and he agreed. It was a waste of his time. If you compare Musk to, say, Bezos, there's nothing that Bezos has done that wouldn't have been done if he hadn't existed. Because Amazon is a great accomplishment. If he hadn't built it, somebody else would have built it. I mean, it was an obvious way to make use of the internet, sell things, okay? Uh, whereas SpaceX and Tesla are two things that really wouldn't have happened unless Musk had dedicated his life and talent to it. So Musk actually has made it, if Musk fell off the planet right now, uh, he still would have made history. He will have moved humanity forward. He proved that electric cars were possible. He proved that private space was possible and uh, that it's possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that it previously thought that only the governments of, of superpowers could do, and not only that, do it in a third the time at a tenth the cost and even do things that they just deemed impossible. Okay, And so his uh, footsteps will be followed. They'll be followed by Rocket Lab and Relativity and other people like this and, and, and elsewhere. And the, the so there it is, but Bezos has not. Now, Musk taking over Twitter, it's possible Musk will make money on Twitter. He's very good at making money. Uh, it's one of his, it's part of his skill set and he, he's really good at it. And it's conceivable he will turn Twitter into a more profitable enterprise. It may be even possible he'll make Twitter better than he currently is, though I don't really see how that's possible because Twitter is infested with the public and they're gonna just be nasty to each other um, no matter what you do. Uh, and, you know, Twitter is Twitter. What are you going to do? And, and um, I'm not particularly alarmed by the prospect that he'll allow Trump to come back on Twitter, uh, although I wouldn't, but he, he, he might. But it, that's all in the noise. The real problem is it's wasting the time of a, of a person who's very talented. All right. Thanks, Bob. Um, do we have anything more from the audience, Allison? We do have a few, but we also only have two more minutes left. So I don't know if you want to get to your whole question, but if not, we have uh, uh, Jared and Indraji and a few others, actually. But Well, ask me one and I'll try to give a short answer this time. Uh, okay, well then, Indraji, I don't know if you would like to unmute or Jared, whoever comes first. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. It's very, very educational and an honor to, to see you speak so much about your history. Uh, my question was, uh, in light of your anti-Malthusian contention, um, which I agree with, by the way, um, do you have any thoughts about the possibility of abiogenic petroleum or that primordial Earth was somewhat like a, a modern-day Titan with seas of methane and that perhaps it's under the crust somewhere? Well, I'm not an expert in that area, but I tend to doubt that the Earth was ever uh, like a uh, uh, Titan. Uh, and obviously wasn't in terms of temperature. Uh, and so it couldn't have had seas of liquid methane. That's impossible. Uh, it, it's physically possible. I suppose that it could have six seeds of, of higher hydrocarbons, but there's no evidence for that. I mean, look, the, the early earth uh, looks like it was a rocky planet with a CO2 and with liquid water and a CO2 dominated atmosphere. That's what all the geology points towards. So I, I think that... Uh, the petroleum is an artifact of, of life. All right, so maybe we could end this, Allison, with your standard question. Well, Hello. my standard question, I have two actually. One is uh, what really gives you hope for the long, long, long-term future? And the other one is how can people help you? <laughs> okay, the thing that gives me hope is the infinite power of human creativity. Uh, and in particular, with respect to space, we now have a much more multifaceted uh, 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 space leadership. In other words, look, Apollo was successful because we had superb political leadership by a generation whose uh, political leaders whose talents were honed basically in World War II. And the political class after that deteriorated in its ability to do great things and has been unable to get its act together. But now we have this multifaceted entrepreneurial space program so that you know if Musk, who is a risk taker, should skate off the edge of the ice, the banner is going to be taken up. We do not have a single point failure, okay, uh, in, in, in this program if you take it as a whole. So, and so I think it's going to succeed. Um, I really do. Uh, and how can people help? Well, um, if you're a NASA official, give us some contracts. But if you're not, 
uh, you could join the Mar Society, which is at marsociety.org. Okay. Also, if you want to read more, um, okay, you know, there's my books. There's the case for Mars. There's the case for space, which is explicitly about the entrepreneurial space revolution. And there is, yes, Merchants of Despair, okay, which will make it clear to you that we're not threatened by there being too many people. We're threatened by people who think there are too many people. And, you know, and that is the conceit we need to review. We need to show that human creativity has infinite power, that the existence of other people is not a minus to you, it's a plus. And so fundamentally, we're not all enemies. In principle, we're all friends if we can just see it the right way. Oh, fantastic. Great ending, Robert. I want to thank you for being available for this. And um, this will uh, be, this has been recorded. It'll be on YouTube. It'll get lots of views. I know you have lots of followers anyway, but I, I think this was a really good one. And I'm really happy uh, to be your friend and colleague and for all the years of wonderful things you've done in all the years to come. All right. Thank you.